Okay, we're getting ready to uh, start our Bible study in a minute. We're going to have some prayer. I'm going to, um, I'm still opening several platforms here. Okay, we're going live. Bear with us. I'm just starting the various platforms that we're trying to go live in. <clears throat> First, you're doing Twitch. We're also doing Pal Talk. We're also doing Hangouts. We're also doing Periscope. So we have all of those. Today we're doing <clears throat> Romans chapter 11. Is uh, we're finishing. We're going to be finishing that chapter. Romans chapter 11. We finished it last last time, but we just, just have some loose ends to finish up before we go into chapter 12. I'm just waiting for the Pal Talk browser to open up. Hasn't opened yet. There it is. Okay. Okay, testing one, two, three. Can you hear me? Testing one, two, three. Okay, good. I am, um, I, I, I heard an announcement earlier today um, about Twitch. Uh, I also, so today we're having, we're going to have several platforms. As you can see there, I put out the Hangouts and um, I'm also putting out right now the Twitch address, which is uh, www.twitch.com backslash raw Hebrew remnant. And so we got the Hangouts to Twitch and we're also on Periscope right now under um, Gabar Sadak. So we're on Periscope, we're on um, Twitch, we're on uh, hangouts and then and so um, uh, so now we have okay so hopefully between all of these platforms we will get something going so that's what we're trying to do um, that's where we're at right now and so um, tonight we're going to finish Romans chapter 11 that's the goal tonight to finish Romans chapter 11 
But before we finish Romans chapter 11, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, ask the Most High Yah to guide us by his spirit as we go into his word today, that his name would be uplifted and honored and given glory as we study his word and seek truth in his word. Um, also, I have some prayer requests. Um, sister asked for uh, Olin, Yandal, Fernando, Ali, and Jay Dahl and his family. So they asked for one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five people uh, for prayer requests. For their, all of those are involved with the awakening. They're dealing with different, um, different stages of the awakening. Uh, different. They're, I don't even know if they know each other, but I know that this particular uh, Akath has been dealing with these people in terms of, of witnessing to them about the awakening, and these have been receptive to that truth, and so she's praying for that. Um, also, want to pray for the scattered people all over the earth that the Father's Spirit is now awakening, that they will continue to be guided in truth and righteousness for his name's sake. Any other prayer requests? Do we have any other prayer requests? All right, so I think we got that. I, I, let me just make sure. I think I got that. I did. I do have that, Sister Josie. I do have that from last week down here. Um, just make sure I have. Yep, I do have that um, from last week here. Yep, I do have that. Uh, anything else? Okay, good. All right, well then let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Father in heaven, we are approaching your throne, most high majesty, in the name of your grace, Messiah, giving you thanks and praise and honor and glory for all the many untold blessings that you bestow upon us, that you keep us alive today, that you fed us, you covered us, you, you housed us. We're praising you and giving you the honor and the glory for all the blessings you bestowed upon us in your grace, Messiah. As we go into your word today, we pray that your spirit, your perfect spirit of righteousness will come upon us and guide us in your word, that your name and your name alone will be uplifted and honored and given glory. We also pray for these special requests, for the request of Batakarat, all of the friends that she had for Isha's request regarding her sister, Jackie, and the traveling. And we pray that you cause her to overcome her fear and anxiety that the devil is chaining her with, that your spirit would cause her to overcome, that your name would be glorified in her testimony. We also pray for all of the scattered nation of your chosen people all over this planet that are now awakening. Please continue to guide us and direct us in truth and righteousness and wisdom that we might always give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In the name of your grace, Messiah, we pray. Amen. Okay. Praise God. So we have been studying Romans chapter 11. And it has been a powerful chapter, as many of the chapters, of course, the sections of the epistle of Romans have been. Um, can you all hear me? I just want to do a mic check. Can you hear me? Testing one, two, three. I want to make sure that you can hear me. Okay, good. I want to make sure that. Let me um, close some of these windows I have open here so we can do that. Okay. All right. Good. I'm glad you can hear. So we were discussing, we're looking at the, the epistle, the letter of Romans. And as we are looking at this letter, what we are doing is we are comparing what the Apostle Shaul or Paul, the Apostle Paul, was used by the Father Spirit to write in the letter of the Romans with what the prophets have said. And this is how we're, we're studying the Bible. And the reason we're doing this 
is because, as again, I want to stress, we believe that this King James Bible, and this is the only one, I mean, not the New International Version of the Bible, not the uh, uh, new, uh, what, what the, uh, uh, the clear word or whichever other ones there be out there, uh, that this King James is, is got the most high's blessing upon it and that it is the word of the most high in truth. And so because of that, we, we gain all of our doctrines, all of our teachings, all of our beliefs from this book. That, that's it. Now, not everybody you know, can believe this book. Some people, believe, as I mentioned, some people believe in the Quran, some people believe in other, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Paraphrases of the Bible. That's what they are, paraphrases. Uh, but that's, and that's not, I'm not talking to those people. I'm dealing with this King James Bible. So everything that we believe to be true, everything that shows us about the future, all of the doctrines, all of the statutes and judgments, the teachings are in this book for the chosen people. Okay. That being the case, if that's the truth, then the book itself should never contradict itself. Okay, so if if what we're, if this book is true, then the teachings and doctrines of this book should not contradict with each other. They should all agree. So, so like whatever doctrines there be in the Old Testament, those doctrines should also be in the New Testament. They should be substantiated. They should balance each other. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? It shouldn't be that we have contradiction. And that is why, and I was trying to explain that to someone today I was talking to, um, Christianity, from which most of us in developed nations have come from, and in many third, so-called third world countries as well, Christianity has many contradictions in it, many contradictions. And, we, and, and because of that, and I'll just name a few, for example, um, the Bible says in the Old Testament that the commandments of Yah should be obeyed. But in the New Testament, the Christians say the commandments have been nailed to Messiah's cross. All right. The, the, the Old Testament has uh, the Most High gave his people a diet uh, special for them to obey in terms of them being his holy and chosen people. He said, because you're my chosen people, you shall not eat any abominable thing. Christians in the New Testament believe that everything they eat is clean. OK, in the Old Testament, we understand that the ancient Hebrew Israelites looked like Egyptians from, from ancient times. They were, they were brown, bronze skinned dark-skinned people. Whereas in the New Testament, Christianity teaches that the Messiah, his name is Jesus, and he's a white man, and he looks like a European. And, and we're finding out that Messiah himself is the grace of the Most High Yah. He himself represents Yah's grace, whereas Christianity teaches that grace um, basically says there's no law and you can just basically be saved because you just believe in Caucasian or white Jesus, right? So there's many contradictions and we can continue on and on and on, but so, but we don't believe as Hebrew Israelites that the Bible contradicts itself, okay? And then Christianity uses the New Testament as its basis of faith, okay? Whereas we use all the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. And then there's Judaism. Now, Judaism takes the first five books of Moses and they call it the Torah. But they contradict themselves because they claim Messiah hasn't come yet. So therefore, they're looking at, the, even they don't even look at all of the first five books of the Bible. They combine that belief in some of that with this other book they have called the Talmud. So they have the Talmudic writings and they have the, some of, of the first five books of what we call of the Bible, the books of Moses. But they don't believe that Messiah from the tribe of Judah actually arrived yet, even the first time. And also, since they are Caucasian and from Europe and from this from Yafet, yet they claim to be Abraham's children. It's a contradiction. Their bloodline does not match up with anything from Abraham or even from the Middle East or anything Semite. It comes from Europe. 
because they, they are European, they're from your faith. So there's lots of contradictions, yet they say they're the chosen people. So there's contradictions in both of that, okay? And the reason there is is because they are loosely based on the Bible, but they're not actually based on the whole Bible. They're loosely based on the Bible. And again, I can bring out even more. For example, the Bible never speaks of Christianity as any established religion. It never speaks of the coming of Christianity except as the great whore. And we will go into that a little bit today. But it never speaks of any religion that Messiah is establishing for his people um, that he's changing from what was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses. Never speaks of that. Okay? Nor does it speak of any Arab prophet called Muhammad that should come, that should be part of the chosen people. It never speaks of that. Okay? It never does. In fact... The prophets of this Bible um, have some things in common. They were all Hebrew Israelites. All Hebrew Israelites. There was no Gentile among the prophets. There was no Arab that wasn't from Isaac's seed from among the prophets. There was prior to the flood prophets like Noah and Seth and Enoch, which come from Adam, prior to the flood. But then when Abraham was chosen from that point, Abraham, then, then Isaac, and then the Most High declared to, to Abraham that Isaac is the chosen seed. From Isaac is the seed called. So from that point on, from Abraham and Isaac, all the prophets came from that seed, including Moses, who wrote the first five books of the Bible. Okay, so there's no there's no Caucasian woman from Maine named Ellen White that's in the Bible as a prophet. There's no Caucasian man that had many little girls as his wives from Utah. Joseph, that's not in the Bible either. Okay, never prophesied of these people. Never prophesied of any Christian denomination as being any chosen people. And as we have read, especially when we read the covenant, and let's take a look at that. In uh, this, we've looked in Exodus before, but let's take a look this time just for the sake of another witness. Let's take a look in the same covenant is, re is reviewed, is, is recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. And again, let's take a look. Uh, we're looking just, we only need to look at the first commandment of the covenant, the first commandment. But in Deuteronomy chapter 5, it gives us a little bit more detail. And it starts at verse 1, and the first commandment starts at verse 7. And so we're going to read from verse 1 down to verse, actually, uh, 10. And actually, all of that is the first commandment, okay? Actually, it's the first uh, two. And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep and do them. Yahweh, our Most High, made a covenant with us, notice that, in Orah, with us, that is with the Israelites, in Orah. Yahweh made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us who are all of us here alive this day. Yahweh talked with you, that is, he talked with a whole nation of people. Yahweh talked with you face to face, in the mount out of the midst of fire. We're going to go over there. That's important. I, and in parentheses, says, I stood between Yahweh and you at that time to show you the word of Yahweh, for ye were afraid by reason of the fire and went not up into the mount, saying, I am Yahweh thy most high, which led thee out of the land of Egypt, or Mizraim, from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have none other gods, or alayim, the word alayim is plural for gods. Thou shalt have none other alayim, or gods, before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters under the earth, beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them, for I, Yahweh, thy most high, am a jealous most high. 
visiting the iniquities of the father upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. The first two commandments. Now the first command, I want you to, please, I want to take note, all the people listening, all the people out here in, in Power Talk, I want you to take note. These commandments were not given to everybody in terms of all the peoples of the earth. Did you notice that? These commandments were not given to everybody. It says Moses called all Israel. Did you see that? It said Moses called all Israel. And then he said he made not the covenant with their fathers, but with them, all of them. Now, wait a minute. Let's just think about that for a second. What came out of Egypt? The Bible says 600,000 men, not including children and women, came out of Egypt. 600,000 men. So there was at least, being that there's at least as many men and women, as women, plus children, there was at least, there was over a million people around that mountain that day. Testing one, two, three. Okay, are you hearing me? So there was over a million people around the mountain that day when the thunder of the of the Most High Creator's voice came from the top of that mountain, and all of them heard it so loud, so clear, that they actually asked Moses to ask him to stop. After he gave the covenant, Moses went up into the mountain and received the instructions of commandments and judgments and statutes that he would now come back and relate to the people. In fact, he said it here that he stood between Yahweh and the people because they were on. Now, what is, why do I say that? Because in this regard, there are over a million witnesses at one time to what happened. Now, they're all dead now, but at the time of the giving of these commandments, there were over one million witnesses to the event. Are you us? Y'all catching that? So like when Muhammad so-called came down from Mount with the Torah, there were no witnesses as to who actually gave that to him. There was no witnesses that heard Allah give him any any message. OK. There was no witnesses to Ellen White's dreams or Joseph Smith's dreams. There was no witnesses to say, oh, yeah, I saw this. Or, yeah, I saw that with them. Or I heard the Most High speaking to them. There were no witnesses. But here in this Deuteronomy, there are over a million witnesses to the voice that spoke to a whole nation at once. <clears throat> and this whole nation is the seed of Isaac. It's the seed of Isaac. Okay, this whole nation is the seed of Isaac and the seed of Jacob. In fact, he called them Israel, and Israel is not just a nation, it's a man's name. It's the name of the man that was called Jacob, who had 12 sons and was renamed Israel or Yashar Al. Yashar Al. Okay. So these commandments were not given to Babylonians. They weren't given to Greeks. They weren't given to Romans. They weren't given to Indians. These commandments were given to Yashar'al, the children of Jacob. So some might say, well, if they were given to the children of Jacob, right? If they're given to the children of Jacob, what happens to the rest of the earth? Well, we also saw how the Most High had intended that the children of Jacob should be the carriers or the repositors or the people that have control of this word to share with the rest of the earth. Okay. Everybody following that. So th that was the plan and it hasn't changed over the centuries. It hasn't changed, but as we know, Israel failed not only in doing that, they failed to obey these commandments, but then again, that was prophesied. And we saw that prophecy in Deuteronomy chapter 28. We saw the end of that prophecy, which is now the awakening that we're talking about in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 30. And why? Why did he just choose this one people? Why, why did he do that? Let's look. The same Deuteronomy answers that question. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Talking about Jacob's children. Deuteronomy chapter 7, beginning at verse 6. And go down to verse 8. Deuteronomy 7, from verse 6 to verse 8. Verse 
For thou, that is the Israelites, are an holy people unto Yahweh thy Most High. Yahweh thy Most High hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Yahweh did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. I mean, a million people making up a nation is a small nation. When you say it's a small nation. But because Yahweh loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, has Yahweh brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So he did it because of a promise to the fathers. Now, why did he promise the father? There was one man. Creator. One man that trusted the creator enough to, to follow his spirit where it led him. And because that of that man trusting the creator's spirit, the creator said to him by his spirit, I'm going to bless your seed. I'm going to bless your seed. And these people are his seed that we're reading about. That's his seed. That's his descendants. And now we understand in our awakening that the Negro is also a descendant of Abraham and, and Isaac. Okay. So now in their failure, let's turn to Leviticus. Let's turn to Leviticus. Chapter 26. That's already taken place. This prophecy has been fulfilled. We're going to, but it's not completely. The entire chapter of Leviticus 26. Begin at the, um, okay, I'm going to begin at, I'm going to begin at verse 30, I want to bring in verse 32, verse 32, and I'm going to go from verse 32 and down to verse 45, and Isha, we're going to go like, so let's go from 32 first down to verse 38, we will break it up as we normally do, okay? So we'll go from 32 to 38 to begin, and then, you know, we'll go bit by bit. This is a prophecy of what would happen to Jacob's children, his descendants, Isaac's children, Abraham's children, after they came into the land, okay? Which is also recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 28, which is also recorded in Ezekiel So recorded in other places as well, as we know. So let's take a look at this. Daniel chapter 9 as well. Daniel chapter 9, which goes with Daniel chapter 10 and 11. Um, okay. Let's take a look at this. Deuteronomy chapter 26 from verse 32 to 38 to start us off. And I will bring the land into desolation. And your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. Talking about, talking about the Israelites. And I will scatter you, that is you Israelites, among the heathen, and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbath. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbath when ye dwell upon it. And upon them that are left alive of you, I will send faintness into your hearts in the lands of your enemies, and the sound of a shaken leaf shall chase them, and they shall flee as fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall when none pursue it. And they shall fall one upon another, it were for a sword. When and ye shall have no power to stand before your enemies. And ye shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. 
And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands. And also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. And they shall confess their iniquity. No, excuse me. If, oh, let me stop right here. I'm sorry, I kept going. Let's go from verse 40 down to verse 46. I kept going, my fault. And let's go from verse, let's go from verse 40 to 46. I got into it here. But you see what's happening. Watch closely now. If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled and they then accept the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember. And I will remember the land. The land also shall be left of them and shall enjoy her Sabbaths while she lieth desolate without them. And they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquities because even because they despised my judgments and because their soul abhorred my statutes. Watch this. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away Neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them. For I am Yahweh, their most high. But I will, for their sakes, remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their most high. Yahweh, excuse me, Ahiah Yahweh. These are the statutes and judgments and laws which Yahweh made between him and the children of Israel in Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. So not only did he give them the covenant, but he promised, he said, this is what's going to happen to you. But even if you go on your enemy's land and you're scattered in your enemy's land, even if that's the case, I'm going to remember the covenant I made with your ancestors which I brought out of the land of Egypt, which is telling us that this prophecy in Leviticus is way in the future from that point, way in the future. He's not even talking about the people right there. He's talking about in the future, which is we, where we are right now. Okay? So the punishment was severe because the Most High does not forget the covenant and agreements he makes with his chosen people, the people of his friend, Abraham. He does not forget ever the promises and covenants that ca they came together with on, on Mount Sinai. And he will, and he had to severely punish them so that he might at a later date bring them back. Which brings us to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy 30. Let's continue in Deuteronomy 30 from verse 1 to verse 7. Okay, actually from 1 to 8. Deuteronomy 30 from 1 to 8. Thank you, Isha. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee. And thou shalt call them to mind, that is the curse and the blessing, you call them to mind, among all the nations with Yahweh thy most high have driven thee. So wait a minute. Here we are in our enemy's lands. The land is eating us up. Black people cannot get ahead in any of the lands they've been scattered into. But as a, as a group of people, we cannot get ahead. Some of us appear to get ahead. And generally, the people that get ahead like that are generally in the entertainment world, which are being paid to entertain the heathen. Being paid to entertain the heathen. Sing, dance, act, play ball, whatever. You're being, tamed, uh, you're being paid to entertain the heathen, which means you're still a slave. And, and it says... When, when these things come upon our mind, that is the masses 
of the chosen people. And I'm, I'm in the United States of America, so I'm talking to that specifically, but this goes to all nations. So the masses, the common people, the masses of the people are going to wake up and say, wait a minute, why is this curse? And we already, you guys have already heard, you guys, some of you have already said it yourself. Why is this happening to us? Why are people stacked up in prisons? Why is it that we get crack cocaine in our neighborhoods and heroin in our neighborhoods? Why are most of our men in jail? Why is it that we get shot in the street where nobody else does? How come foreigners come to this land that came after us and can, can prosper before us? Right? Haven't you asked these questions? Why is it that this happens to us? Because this is the part of the curse. And we're in our enemy's lands. We're in our enemy's land. Okay? It's part of the curse. And he says, when we wake up and understand that, look what he said, verse 2, and shall return. See, when you wake up and understand, return to your God. Not the white Jesus. Not Muhammad. Not Allah. Okay? Not the Book of Mormon or Ellen White or the SDA Church or Christianity or Judaism. No. When you return to your God, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, from whose bloodline you are, and shall return unto Yahweh thy most high, and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children with all thine heart and with all thy soul. So the awakening causes us to remember who we were, remember what happened to us and to our fathers, understand why it happened. And as Leviticus said, acknowledge that our punishment is just and then return to our God, our father. Okay. And we do that through the grace extended to us, named Yahweh Messiah, who comes from the Father as a form of the Father's grace to bring our mission is to save his people, right? And bring them back to their Father. Everybody got that so far? To save his people from sin and to bring them back to their Father. Okay? That then, Yahweh thy most high will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations where the Yahweh thy most high have scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will Yahweh thy most high gather thee and from thence will he fetch thee. And Yahweh thy most high will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. And Yahweh thy most high will circumcise thy heart and the heart of thy seed, to love Yahweh thy most high with all thy heart and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. Watch the verse 7 now. And Yahweh thy most high will put all these curses upon thine enemies and on them that hate thee which persecuted thee and thou shalt return and obey the voice of Yahweh and do all his commandments which I command thee this day so the punishment on the enemies the curses that will come on our enemies that have persecuted us come as a result of us awakening and coming back to our God do you see that there was there was no mention of us um, overthrowing the enemy's governments. There was no mention of us killing them. The mention was us returning to our God and then him taking the curses that was put on us and put them on them. Everybody see that? And this is totally focused on the Israelite nation. Totally focused on them. Okay? So now we see the severity that come upon Abraham's children. Abraham, Isaac, Ishaak, and Jacob's children who became Israel. We can see the punishment and severity that came upon them for generations. Now, the interesting thing here, 
as we read last week, which we're going to read again today, the interesting thing here is that the, as we, in fact, let's go back. Let's go to Romans 11. Let's go to Romans 11. We're going to come back and look at more prophecy from, from the Old Testament, from the prophets in a few minutes. But let's look at Romans 11. And let's start at verse 25. Verse 25. Down to verse, let's see. I'm going to go from verse 25 down to verse 27. Okay. Okay. He's writing to the converts at Rome, the Gentile converts at Rome. That's what this epistle is. For I would not, brethren, and of course the Israelites by blood that lived at Rome as well. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, that is to the Israelites, the, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when I shall take away their sins. See, the promise is to them. Remember, he said, I came not before the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And I know Gentiles keep asking, well, what about us? You guys are saved as the Israelite nation is restored. As the Israelite people are restored, the Gentiles can get salvation because it's going to come through them. He said, and, and look, somebody might ask, well, what about the Romans? How did these people that he's writing to? Who's writing to them? And Hebrew Israelite is writing to them. Who taught them? And Hebrew Israelite taught them. And they're obtaining salvation. So severity came on the nation of the true Israelite people, the bloodline. Bad severity, so that so that it lasted. Is it went into slavery? It went into beatdowns. It went into murders. It went into taking away of land. It went into way, slavery and chains and all kind of horrors for hundreds of years. Severity, okay? Not only just kicked off the land, but murdered on the land. Thousands and thousands. They said over a million uh, Hebrew slaves were in slave markets all over what you call now the Middle East and Africa and in Europe. Oh, millions. And they were black. Slaves. Okay? That's the severity. So that as a result of that, as a result of that, so that the Gentiles can receive this word, can receive this truth. So that the Gentiles can receive this truth. Okay? So that they might be able to be saved. All right? But the story doesn't end there. Okay? The story doesn't end there. And let's take a look at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Let's look at a little prophecy in Daniel chapter 2. Now, before we go into Daniel chapter 2, I just want to give you all a little quiz, okay? If, if you recall, the last week we looked at Genesis chapter 10. Remember that? We looked at Genesis chapter 10, and we looked at where Gentiles come from. Did we see that? We see that? Remember last week? And we, we saw that Gentiles are descendants of Yafeth or Japheth, which, were, which is the youngest son or the middle son, actually the youngest son of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They always say them in that order, which is the order of birth, Shem, Ham, Japheth. So Japheth was the youngest son. Shem was the firstborn. Ham was the middle child. And we saw that from Japheth came all the nations that we now know as European nations, right? Ashkenaz, Togomar, uh, Madai, all of these nations that we now know as European nations came from Yafet. Okay. Now, why they came, you know, why you got Ham as being dark and Shem being brown, but Yafet being pale. Hey, that's a whole nother thing. We don't even talk about that. But Yafet is where they came from. Okay. 
You felt where they came from. So now, if something originates in Europe, okay, I want to make sure you all hear me now. If something originates in Europe, Okay, if it originates in Europe, that means it originates among Europeans. You understand that that's coming from your fat. Testing one, two, everybody got me? It's coming from your fat. It's not coming from Shem. It's not coming from Ham. If something originates with Hamitic people, which is what we call so called African people, from Ham, that would be Hamitic. That's, that's, that's from Ham. But if something comes from Europe, it'll mean it's original. Then come from Europe, it's being originated from your faith. So that if a religion started in Europe, listen to me carefully now. If a religion started in Europe and that religion spread to the whole planet Earth, we would know a couple of things. First of all, that religion started with your faith. Testing one, two, three, right? If a religion sprang out of Europe and it covered the whole Earth, we know that that, your, that religion came from your faith. We would know that that religion would not be true. Why? Because it is not from Shem. Because the Shemites, from where you get Isaac, is the chosen seed. So the truth is going to come out of the chosen seed. Testing one, two, three. The Most High is going to reveal his truth to the chosen seed. All right? But if something comes out of Europe as an original religion, and it spreads throughout the whole earth and it influences the whole earth. We can know right now that's a false religion and it's a false God. So let's take a look at Daniel. Daniel had a dream. Actually, it was King Nebuchadnezzar that had the dream. Okay, King Nebuchadnezzar had the dream. And Daniel interpreted the dream. The Most High showed Daniel the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And not only after he showed it to him, he gave Daniel the interpretation of the dream. So let's cut right to that dream in Daniel chapter 2. Because uh, what Daniel is going to tell Nebuchadnezzar is he has made known the future to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a Hamite that would eventually become a converted Israelite to the God of Israel. He'd be converted to that body. You get to the time you get to chapter four of Daniel, he get converted to the true God. Okay? He had to get spanked, but he got converted. So let's take a look. So, so now the Most High revealed to him the future. And he didn't understand it. Daniel the Hebrew broke it down for him. Daniel the Hebrew broke it down for him, okay? So let's take a look. Daniel chapter two, uh, let's start at verse 27. Daniel two from verse 27 down to verse 30. Okay, Daniel two, 27 to 30. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. See, he's telling him the future. What shall be in the latter days? Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed, what should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. As for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. So Daniel is telling him this Hebrew from Judah is telling this heathen king from Ham, listen. You are thinking about the future. You're thinking about what happens in the hereafter. The creator heard your thoughts and gave you a dream. And he's showing you the future. Okay, everybody got that? See, he's showing you the future. Okay, so now let's take a look at the future. Here's the, the dream. Let's go from verse 31 down to verse 35. This is the dream. Daniel's going to tell Nebuchadnezzar what he dreamt before Nebuchadnezzar could tell anybody. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. 
this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So what did he see? He saw an image. And the image had gold, silver, brass, iron, as far as the metals. And then it had clay. He also saw a stone that was came out of nowhere. It wasn't cut out of a mountain with hands, wasn't chiseled out. It just broke off and came and destroyed it by smiting this image in his feet. And it smote it to such a degree that all the elements that it was made of turned into chaff. You know what chaff is? That's what's left over. It's like dust. That's what's left over of wheat. It's like dust. That's why he said, like the chaff of summer threshing floor, what's left over is like dust. It's like sawdust. So when that stone hit it, it all turned to dust. Everybody got me so far? So now he's going to explain the dream. Now he told Nebuchadnezzar exactly what he dreamt. So now he's going to explain to Nebuchadnezzar what, he, what, what it means. Because he's the Hebrew that's going to bring the interpretation. Okay. Verse 36, 37, and 38. Daniel chapter 2, 36, 37, and 38. Notice what it says. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the Most High of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee, that is you Nebuchadnezzar, ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So now he's telling Nebuchadnezzar, your kingdom of Babylon is representing the head of gold. So far, so good. The kingdom of Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar is representing the head of gold, okay? All right, verse 39, Daniel chapter two, verse 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. So after Babylon, there's gonna be a, kingdom that overthrows Babylon, but it's inferior to Babylon as silver is inferior to gold. And then after that kingdom would become a third kingdom, even more inferior of brass that would bear rule over all the earth. Who are these kingdoms? Well, what came after Babylon? We know it from Daniel. We're going to come right back. We know from Daniel chapter five that it was the Medes and the Persians that came after Babylon. Notice again in Daniel chapter five, we'll come right back to two in a minute to continue this, but Daniel chapter five, Daniel chapter five, verse 30 and 31. Daniel 5, 30 and 31. Notice what it said. Daniel 5, 30 and 31. In that night was Belshazzar. Belshazzar was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson that was king of Babylon. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. So you can see here, the Medes, and they were in cahoots with the Persians, the Medes and the Persians, took over the Babylonian kingdom. 
They were the silver. Everybody with me so far? Okay, everybody with me so far? Okay, so that's historical also, but the Bible is telling us. Now we want to know what came after the Medes and the Persians. Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 will show us what came, and I'm giving you the quick and dirty on this prophecy. We go into much more detail when we study Daniel, but what came after the Medes and the Persians? Let's take a look. Daniel chapter 8, verse 20 and 21. Okay. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. That's Daniel 8, verse 20 and 21. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. So after the Medes and the Persians came who? What does it say there? After the Medes and the Persians came who? Greece. Everybody see that? So you had Babylon, then the kingdom of Medes and Persians, then the empire of Greece. There it is right there in the scriptures. Okay. Now let's take a look at the fourth king. Let's go back to Daniel chapter two. Okay. And now we're starting at verse 40. Daniel chapter two, verse 40. Okay. Daniel 2, 40. So we know it's Babylon. Then came the Medes and the Persians. Then came Alexander, the so-called great with the Greeks. Verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, as iron that breaketh all these, it shall break in pieces and bruise. So the fourth kingdom is of less value. It's iron, but it's harder. So it breaks all the other kingdoms. It's a, it's, a, it's a ruthless, violent kingdom. And all of these were violent, but this one is the most violent. Okay? All right? Now, I want you to notice something, and I always tell people this when we study this in Daniel. Notice something about the iron. The iron are, is in the legs, but how far down into the body does the iron go? The iron goes all the way to the feet. Did you notice that? The iron goes in from the legs, it goes all the way into the toes. Now, when it's in the feet, it's mixed with clay, but there's still iron there. In fact, let's take a look at it. Verse 41. Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes were part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest that the iron mixed with miry clay. Okay, verse 42. As the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. So, now, you remember, a stone hit the statue in his feet. The feet and the legs are part clay and part iron. So even though the kingdom is divided and throughout, woven throughout the kingdom, is the iron. So that the iron is, whoever the kingdom of the iron is, is in existence at the time the whole thing is destroyed. Which means it's in existence today. Testing one, two, three. So once we find out from the scriptures what kingdom came after Greece, you can know right now that that kingdom is woven throughout the empires of the earth today. Though it says here the kingdom is partly strong and partly broken, but it still has in it of the strength of the iron. So whatever the iron represents, it's around right now. Somebody say, well, what, who is that? That comes from all the way from Greeks empire to now. Let's take a look. Who came after the Greeks? Luke Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. I'm going to begin at verse 1 and go down to verse 2. Okay? Luke chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus 
that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. So when a country is able to tax the entire earth, can we say that country rules the earth if it's able to have power to tax the entire world? Is that not a world power? So what country came out, what empire came out of after Greece? Well, what empire was Caesar Augustus emperor of? Very easy, obvious. It's Rome. Okay, so let's talk about the implications. Now, before we continue, Rome is in Europe, is it not? Rome is in Europe. Therefore, Rome is a, a nation or a city, in this case, an empire that was um, founded by the sons of Yafet the third son of Noah, right? So that's a European empire founded by Yafet. Everybody got me so far? Testing one, two, three. So out of Rome, the fourth empire, I want you to notice something, Daniel chapter seven. Out of Rome, the fourth, in Daniel seven is the fourth beast, whereas in Daniel two is the fourth, is the metal, the fourth metal. But in Daniel seven is the fourth beast, Look, look at this. Daniel chapter 7. Verse 7 and 8. Daniel 7. Verse 7 and 8. And after this I saw in the night visions. And behold. A fourth beast. Dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. See, it's showing you the iron there, letting you know who this is. It, it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse or different from all the beasts that were before it or all the kingdoms before it. And it had 10 horns. I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So this fourth empire was going to be different than all the empires that were before it. We don't know yet why, but the Bible is going to show us. And it was still breaking in pieces and bruising because it's wrong. Okay. And so the question should be asked, well, how is Rome ruling the earth, at least in part, or interwoven throughout the earth today. Let's take a look. Let's stay in Daniel chapter 7. And I want you to notice what this little horn that comes out of Rome does. Daniel chapter 7, from verse 19, from verse 19 to verse 25. Daniel 7 19 to 25, the little horn that came out of Rome. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up before whom three fell even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose mouth was more stout than his fellows. I held, and the same horn made war with the saints. Who are the saints? Can somebody remind me? According to the scriptures, who are the saints? Who are the saints? Testing, y'all hear me? Who are the saints? It says the horn made war with the saints. Well, who are the saints? Verse 21, you see that? Who are the saints? That's right. The Israelite people are the saints. So this horn made war with Jacob's children. Testing one, two, three. The horn made war with Jacob's children and prevailed against them. Prevailed against Jacob's children. Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came, 
that the saints possess the kingdom. So this little horn would rule over Jacob's children until his time is fulfilled. Where well, we heard that before. Let's continue. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms of the earth and shall devour the whole earth. See, the iron is spread throughout the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Then the 10 horns out of this kingdom, excuse me, and the 10 horns out of this kingdom are 10 kings that shall arrive and another shall arise after them and he shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings. In verse 25, I was telling you about this little horn. And he shall speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the most high and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. So wait, what's different about this fourth beast, Rome? Is it not only is a power like the others, a ruthless power, but this is a religious power as well. Why do we know that? Because it said he made war with the saints and he spake great words against the most high. It's a religious power. He made, he spake great words against the most high and the saints are given into his hand. For a time. Okay. So what religious power comes out of Rome that speaks against the Most High, that thinks to change the laws and the times of the years of the Most High, that changes how years are judged and how the, there's only one. See, you see how the Bible does it? It breaks it down for you. So that there's only one, there's only one religious power that's a country, because the Catholic Church is also a country. Did y'all know that? The Vatican's a country. There's only one power that comes out of Rome, that changes times and laws, that is in, that is in the earth today and is in, interwoven all over the earth. Because the Roman Catholic Church is the origin of Christianity. And Christianity in Roman Catholicism and all of its various denominations are interwoven throughout the earth. Correct? Not only that, if the truth be known, I know my Muslim brothers and sisters don't want to hear this, but it was a Roman Catholic priest that taught Muhammad how to read with that Roman Catholic priest's daughter, Khadijah, being his first of many wives. And that's how Roman Catholicism helped create Islam. Problem was, they weren't betting on Islam going buck wild. They created it in order to get the Arabs to be under their control. But the Arabs went buck wild and went nuts and spread the religion of Islam all over the earth, as Revelation chapter 9 shows us they would. overcome Islam, which is what we're watching right now. That's what we're watching right now. Okay? Overcome his child that went crazy. So now we can see a religion that came from Yafet that's against the Most High will rule the earth in the last days. And I think we see that. Do we not see that? Is it not Christianity led by Rome? That's controlling things. Even though the number of Muslims, which is also originated by Rome, outnumbers the Catholics and the Christians, the Catholics and Christians still control them. It's Christian countries like the United States and the and British country and Germany and France that bring all them bombs into the Middle East and kill all them women and children. Y'all know that, right? It's Christian countries that do that. Okay, so that's already happening. So now we know that as the Most High had severity on his chosen people until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, now he's going to have severity on the Gentiles that have rejected his truth and that have turned his truth into a lie. So at first, the severity was on Jacob's children. 
so that the Gentiles can receive salvation. Now the awakening of Jacob's children causes the severity now to go on, the Gentiles, because of this fake, false religion that is dominating the earth. He said, the time will come that the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom. Let's look at that. Again, Daniel chapter 7, verse 26 and 27. Daniel 7, 26 and 27. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion. The little horn's dominion will be taken away. And to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given weight to who? To the people whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And all dominions shall serve and obey him. So you see. That is the severity that's coming. Well, let's take a look at that last severity more in the saints of the Most High taking the kingdom in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Let's start Revelation 19 at verse 11 and go down to verse, from verse 11, let's go down to verse 19. Revelation 19, 11 through 19. The beast now in this and this narrative is represented as the Romish church and the government of the Romish church and all the governments the Romish church control throughout the earth. The corporatized governments, corporations. Take a look. Roman, uh, Revelation 19 from verse 11 to 19. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of Yahweh. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Al Shaddai. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls of that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them. And the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw well, who? the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Now, you remember, we just read in Daniel chapter nine that the judgment shall sit and that he's going to come and take the kingdom and the kingdom given to the saints. This is that process being explained right here in Revelation chapter 19. Notice verse 20 and 21 of Revelation 19, verse 20 and 21. This is the severity upon the Gentiles. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that had worshiped his image. These were both cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horn, which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. This is the destruction of the Gentiles. When the kingdom of Yahweh, through his son, his grace, Yahweh Shah, is established 
for the house of Israel and those that are the captives with the house of Israel, the captive Gentiles with them. But the majority of the Gentiles are going to be destroyed. Now, this is a fantastic event. Like, you know, this is something you would see in a Marvel comics, right? And so if it comes to pass, or should I say when it comes to pass, you're going to see it. People may not believe it. That's all good. Israelites are looking for this. And we're already seeing the start of it with the beginning of the awakening. This is on the way coming now. The awakening is the sign. The awakening that we are now witnessing. The awakening of who the true Hebrews are, of them waking up to who they are, and them returning to the Most High. There's lots of opposition from all angles. As we saw, he tries to wear out the saints of the Most High. He tries to destroy the Hebrews today, destroy the Negroes. He tries to do it. But as we awaken and we turn to our God, there's absolutely nothing Asatan and his Pope and his false prophets can do anything to stop what's coming. They can't do it. Okay? They cannot do anything to stop what's coming. So let's now look back now and finish Daniel, I mean Romans, the epistle of Romans, chapter 11. Now that we have all of that history and we understand the times of the Gentiles versus the times of the Hebrews and how the severity come on the Hebrews for the Gentile sake. And now we can see that it's going to be reversed in these last days. Let's take a look now. Romans chapter 11. We're going to start at verse 26 and read down to verse 36. Romans 11, 26 to 36. So all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel... They are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of Yahweh are without recompense. For as ye in times past have not obeyed Yahweh, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For Yahweh hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. O oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of Yahweh, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the master? And who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. Okay. So brothers and sisters, as you can see, there's a completion here. There's a, there's a closure. There's a full circle. Israelites reject Messiah, get severely punished by Gentiles. Gentiles in turn receive Messiah, receive truth of the Israelites. Then Gentiles turn the truth into a lie, turn around and oppress the chosen seed, the saints, until the point comes when their saints awaken and the Father comes and hears their cry as they cry to him and they turn back to their Father and Father sends his grace Messiah with a war tribe to come back and destroy Gentiles so that the saints will get the kingdom. And the Gentiles that will be are those surrender to the word given to them through the awakened Israelites. Completion, full circle. Praise the Most High Yah. You all got that? I know there's a lot. We went through a lot today. But I had to show the full circle. I had to show how we fell as Israelites and how we turn around and how the Gentiles benefited from our fall. But now they got wise in their own conceits, started false religion, and now they're corrupted in this full circle. And at the end, all Israel shall be saved. 
praise the Most High. Yeah. Let's have a word of prayer. Most High Yahweh, we are again very thankful, very grateful for how wise you are, how unsearchable your wisdom is, how powerful your prophecy Guide and direct our paths that we might be faithful unto death, that we might also obtain, as Paul did, a crown of life. In the name of Messiah, Yahweh, your grace, we pray. Amen. Praise the Most High.